going to cover DNA replication and cell division. Um, kind of how cells divide. This is not going to be sex cells like sperm and eggs. This is just going to be body cells like uh, cells that you'll find in your eyes or in your arm or just normal cells throughout the body. Pretty much any other cell in your body that's not sperm and egg. How those cells divide, um, how the DNA inside of those cells are replicated, um, and things like that. <clears throat> so why do your cells need to divide? Well, first off, your cells have a lifespan, just like every other uh, living organism on the planet. They live for a certain period of time, and then they die. Your cells are no different. Um, they have to replace themselves. They need to make copies of themselves, because, because if they didn't, um, eventually all of your cells would die, and you would go away. You would cease to exist. So they need to replace themselves um, when they die. Um, sometimes they get damaged. Um, you cut yourself, they need to repair the damage, so they need to be able to make more cells. Um, things like that. So countless reasons why cells need to divide. Just day-to-day -day maintenance of your body. Um, sometimes you need to grow from being tiny as a little small child to an adult. So you need to add more cells to your body um, and things like that. So cells divide for countless different reasons. Um, so the pro uh, process of, of cell division um, is what we're going to talk about in just a second. Um, but cell division plays, like I said, um, certain roles in reproduction, making sex cells and things like that. We, um, it's a different lecture, meiosis. Um, growth, making you larger so you're not just the same amount of cells that you were to start with, um, and development, making you uh, grow certain uh, body parts and things like that as you, uh, as you uh, start from an embryo um, to an adult kind of thing. Um, so fairly easy on all these, uh, but you need your cells to be able to divide constantly to repair damage um, and allow you to grow and things like that. So from the get-go, um, the very first thing that's going to happen is sperm and eggs going to unite to form a fertilized zygote. These sperm and eggs are uh, haploid. Uh, they've been formed by a process called meiosis, which is a later lecture um, in this lecture series. Um, and then once they unite, they form a diploid zygote, um, which is a, a cell that has two copies um, of each chromosome, one from mom and one from dad. So two copies of chromosome one, and one from mom and one from dad. So two of each kind of thing. So this diploid cell um, is going to divide by a process of called mitosis. Every single diploid cell in your body, which is going to be every other cell in your body, if you're a male, that's not sperm, and every other fa uh, cell in your body, if you're a female, that's not an egg. So everything that's not these two um, is going to be formed uh, via mitosis. So once the cells have united the sperm and egg to form the zygote, um, mitosis will take over, and all the rest of the cells will divide by mitosis. So, um, once I, uh, like I mentioned, this is exactly what we talked about here, um, the formation of those sex cells to make them, you need to make a half the number of chromosomes inside of each cell here. Um, this baby has 46 chromosomes, you need 23 in each sperm and egg to unite to form 46 again. If you had 46 from sperm from dad, 46 from egg from mom, you'd have way too many chromosomes, um, and then this baby would not have the correct number of chromosomes. So you need half from dad, half from mom. Um, so haploid cells. So you need a different way to form these. So that's why meiosis exists. Um, those haploid, haploid, half, half is combined to make half, half equals one to make a baby kind of thing. So very easy concept here. So mitosis is the process, like I mentioned, um, of growing you from this point to this point. Everything that forms from the second that this occurs, once this is fertilized, all of the cells that are pretty much going to arise from here to there, um, and then keeping your body uh, maintained, damage, repairing things, um, is going to be formed via mitosis, this uh, process here. So mitosis um, allows you, like I mentioned, to grow larger, to fix damage inside of your cells. Um, if you're an organism that has the ability to do this, like the salamander here, he's growing back his tail. We may have lost it, an animal got it, or maybe got damaged. Um, they drop them to avoid predators so he can grow his uh, his tail back. You can see the little nub poking out here. They can grow back arms. They can grow back legs, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then if you're an asexual organism, they can divide by mitosis. They don't need to have sex. They don't need to shake up their genetics. Um, so they can sometimes divide by mitosis, uh, but not always. So mitosis, once again, is just making an identical copy um, of the cell that you came from. So one cell into two. So you make one copy into two kind of thing. So two identical copies come from one original cell. Um, so cell death is also a part of cell life. Um, and the cell death in this case is called apoptosis. And apoptosis is going to be kind of a, a programmed cell death. Um, kind of cell death for a reason. 
not just, oh, I fell and cut myself or um, you got poisoned or something like that and that caused your cell's death or virus or disease. This is going to be programmed cell death. The cell has been instructed to die by the body for a reason. Um, so in utero, um, when babies are developed, and especially very closely related species, um, this concept works a lot for uh, humans and things like that. Um, um, different genders works a little bit like this too. Um, your arms and your legs and things kind of are formed blobby. This is in chickens and ducks, so duck here and chicken. Um, their legs are formed blobby. Our fingers kind of work the same way when we're in utero. Um, we're kind of blobby. Um, that we're kind of webbed up in here. So um, very closely related species. Their um, embryos look very similar. So this duck, um, they have both arise from a very uh, similar evolutionary standpoint, which is why they look like this, which is why they're so similar. Um, so in the duck, these webbing um, arose, uh, evolutionary speaking, and in the chicken, they also arose too. Um, in the, but the chicken doesn't need them as an adult, where the duck does. And now in the duck, they, these cells will stay alive. Um, the body does not program these cells to die. So as the um, duck continues to uh, grow and develop, the webbing will stay between their feet. Those cells will stay alive. Those cells will stay constantly divide by mitosis to keep um, this webbing between that ad adult duck's feet so he can swim. Now in the chicken, those cells are programmed to die as that baby chicken develops. Um, the older he gets, those cells will be programmed um, and by the body to die, apoptosis. It will essentially package the little cell up into a small little um, um, envelope ready to die, um, and then it will essentially destroy all of the uh, uh, DNA and nucleus, all of the things inside of the cells, um, and then just destroy the cell. That's the process of apoptosis. So it will carve out this little uh, structure here. Um, it kind of works the same way in us. It carves out the uh, um, webbing in between the, uh, ch the toes of this little chicken here. Um, whereas it's very closely related species, the duck um, doesn't has those uh, webbing still remaining, and that works the same way in people. Why some people have more webbing than others, kind of thing. Um, apoptosis can also be used to remove cells that are broken. Um, if your body realizes that a cell is broken, um, it can program it. It can instruct it um, to remove itself, so it doesn't cause any more damage, kind of thing. Very interesting process. So before your cells can divide, um, they need to make a copy of their DNA. So DNA, if you, uh, if you remember, um, is essentially the instructions that are used to make a brand new organism. So you need a full copy um, of DNA to be able to be you kind of thing. So if you want to make a copy of you, you need to have a full copy of your DNA to give to that copy. Um, so that's how that works. So the very first thing that cells need to do before they can make an identical copy of their cell, um, so one goes into two, you can see this happening here, is the original cell that's going to split needs to make two copies of the DNA that are inside of it. One that it can keep and one that it can give to the new cell kind of thing. So this guy can keep a copy and give one to the new cell. So one cell can split to two and each cell ends up with a copy of the DNA inside. Very important for the daughter cell, which is the uh, the new cells, both of the daughter cells, to have a copy of the DNA so they can both be functioning cells and do what they're supposed to do. So to replicate the DNA, um, it's going to occur in three major steps, and here's what we're going to talk about here. Um, so this is a very easy concept to understand. I'm going to post a video that goes along with this to show you guys how this works in 3D, and you can watch the uh, um, actual um, DNA strand unzip and watch the little nucleotides come in and things like that. So the very first step, step one, is going to be helicase. DNA helicase is going to come in. I mean, it's going to unzip the DNA strands. If you can see here, if you have your double-stranded DNA, it's in a double-stranded helix, which both twisted together. Um, so it's held together with uh, covalent bonds. Holds the nucleotides together and holds the strands of DNA together as well. Um, so this DNA uh, enzyme here, helicase, is going to come in and it's going to unwind um, and unzip the DNA. So one thing it's going to do, if you've ever taken a, a piece of a rope that's been twisted together and you untwist it, if you hold on to the end, it's going to get real tight kind of as you uh, untwist the end of it. Um, the same thing would happen to DNA here. It would get really tight and twisty towards the end of the DNA. Um, so helicase helps that from, keeps that from happening. It keeps the DNA molecule from getting super, super coiled, is what that's called. It helps it from getting messed up. I mean, it's also going to unzip apart, break apart those covalent bonds that holds the DNA strand together um, so it can be replicated. You can't replicate 
are glued together book, you have to open up the pages of the book to be able to replicate the stuff on the inside kind of thing. So this guy's going to open up each individual page of the book um, so you can make a copy of each side of the page kind of thing. So the book's closed here. You have to open the book up to make a copy of page one and then page two on the inside. You can't make a copy of a closed book. So this guy's going to open the book so you can make a copy. So the next step, so it's going to occur, um, is step number two. The enzyme DNA polymerase is going to bond um, to the new strands of DNA that are going to be formed. So the old strand you can see here um, has been broken into two pieces. The book has been opened. One strand goes to the left, one to the right. Um, and the enzyme DNA polymerase is going to come in. It's going to sit on the old strands and it's going to make a complementary new strand to the DNA chain. Now if you recall, A bonds to T, G bonds to C. Um, a to T, G to C kind of thing. So you can see that up here. So if there's an A over here, um, on the old strand, the new DNA polymer or the DNA polymerase will add a brand new, um, there's an A over here, we'll add a brand new T over here. If there's a G over here, we'll add a brand new C. Um, so you have one chain that's brand new, one side of the book, one page is totally brand new, added by the DNA polymerase. And one strain is going to be old um, from the original strain. Um, so this is the... Uh, uh, this is called the complementary strain, and that's the original strain, um, strand of DNA, excuse me, not strain, strand. Complementary, the new one that's made, and the original strand. So anyway, one strain is going to be made, as you can see, this DNA is going to run this direction, and the other one's going to run this direction. Um, and then this has to do with the way that the uh, nucleotides are set up. You can see the A's are upside down on one side, um, whereas they're right side up on the other one. So actually, that's a really not a good example. Uh, let's see if we can find one that works that way. Okay, so C's are C's right here. You can see it's right side up, um, but a C's right side up on, over here. Um, so this has to, to do with the way that this, this, this they run. So the blue strand here you can see is the old strand. One of them has right side or upside down C's, and one of the other original strands has right side up C's. So the complementary strand, the light blue one that's being added, one of them also has right side up T's, C's, and the other one has upside down C's. And this concept, the way that one of them runs upside down and the other one runs right side up, has to do with the way that they're copied. Um, so DNA polymerase has to copy them in the right direction. So one of them is going to be copied upside down, and the other one's going to be copied right side up. So one complementary strain runs runs direction, and the other one runs the other direction. So the next thing that's going to happen is once these new nucleotides have been added, um, um, the DNA molecule is going to be finished. Um, you're going to be done. Oh, sorry, I skipped a step in there. Um, so DNA ligase is an enzyme that's going to glue these covalent bonds back together. Um, so once the nucleotides have been added, DNA ligase is going to uh, click these bonds back together and reform the uh, um, covalent bonds that were not formed yet um, and refix that bond that's been broken by uh, DNA helicase. So DNA ligase is going to fix that. Anyway, um, so once the DNA replication is finished, um, you will end up with one original strand that has been broken apart into two. Um, one of those original strains will stay um, and have a complementary strain added to it, and the other original strain will have another complementary strain added to it. So one ends up with two halves that are then filled in with a brand new half, so one turns into two. Um, that one turns into two halves that then have two new halves added um, to DNA. So one copy with one half of the original DNA and then a new half will go to one cell and then one half of the original DNA with the other new complementary strain will go to the other cell and that's how cell division works. Once the DNA is replicated you now have two full copies of all the DNA inside of the cell. The cell is then ready in theory to divide and make another copy of itself. So in prokaryotes Dark, uh, domain or bacteria um, and archaea. This is going to be things like bacteria, um, E. coli, salmonella that you're familiar with and things like that. Um, so when these guys divide, it's a very simple process. There's not a whole lot going on um, in asexual division, asexual mitosis. Very simple, simple division. Um, there's no nuclear membrane. Um, there's nothing that's really going to go on with these that makes their uh, their division super, super simple, or super, super complex, sorry. Very easy on here. So um, the same as our original cell here, um, every other cell, the very first thing we need to do is replicate our DNA. So you can see our little prokaryote here um, and his little DNA strand on the inside. So the very first thing, DNA polymer, our helicase is going to unwind our genes, our genetic DNA strand here. 
DNA polymerase is going to come in and reform our new complementary strains. You can see that forming over here, the new blue one. Um, and then it's going to be uh, bonded together, and we're done with our replication of our DNA. So the first thing is replicate your DNA. You can also see the cells getting a little longer. It's elongating, getting ready to split into two cells. So what's going to happen is once this is started, um, the DNA is replicated, it's going to bond itself to the cell membrane. And you can see that happening up here. It stuck itself inside of the cell membrane of these original cells on the side. So one over here on the side and one over here on the side. And this is to ensure that when this cell actually does split in half, that the DNA goes where it's supposed to go. Um, if it was just able to flow, uh, freely float around inside of the cell, it could go um, over here and then float back over here. Um, when the cell divides in half, you might not have the DNA on the right side. So it's going to bond to the cell membrane up here just to make sure that when this cell divides in half that it's actually on the right side. It stays where it's supposed to be. Um, so once that uh, occurs, the DNA is replicated. The DNA, the replicates, and then the original have uh, um, embedded themselves in the cell membrane so they can stay where they're supposed to be. The cell will then finish pinching its cell membrane in half, um, splitting the cell into two identical copies. These are called daughter cells. So one original cell splits itself into two identical copies. And this is binary fission in bacteria, prokaryotes. Very, very, very simple, easy, one into two. You literally make a copy of your DNA and then split in half. Very, very, very simplistic process. Um, so here we go. Very easy. Um, your parent cell's got one chromosome in it. Attach that, replicate that chromosome, stick it inside the cell membrane. You can see the membrane's going to start to uh, um, form here to split this guy apart. Um, it's going to eventually continue to squeeze, continue to squeeze, and eventually split the cell completely in half. Um, once again, I'll post some uh, su supplementary videos so you can watch this occur um, in 3D. Very, very, very simple process, um, the way that prokaryotes divide. Now, eukaryotes, on the other hand, we are eukaryotes. Um, most of the organisms that you're probably familiar with are going to be eukaryo eukaryotic. Um, we divide by a process called mitosis. And everything but sperm and eggs, all the other cells in your body, are going to make copies of themselves and be formed by mitosis. So inside of our nucleus is where this process is going to occur. Eventually the nucleus will, um, first things first, um, you have to uh, replicate your DNA, the exact same thing that it was in every other cell. Um, prokaryote or eukaryote. So the first thing, the nucleus is going to have the DNA replication occur. All of the synthesis of proteins that are going to be needed for um, cell division to occur are also going to be uh, formed. So um, this is our normal cell. You can see it's a cell just doing its day-to-day -day business. Inside of here, its DNA is going to be just loosely packed together. Um, it's not going to be condensed into the form of a chromosome. You can't see them. I mean, once the cells, uh, the chromosomes can become condensed up, and you can start to see the chromosomes to condense. This is just a yarn ball, and you can see the actual individual. Uh, um, excuse me, this is yarn piled on the floor, just a big ball of yarn, blob of yarn, I should say. I mean, this is individual yarn balls. You can start to see the organized yarn. And once these little chromosomes, the yarn starts to get organized into the shape of chromosomes, then. Um, cell division is going to occur. Once these chromosomes condense, that's when cell division is going to occur. So why does this condensing occur? Well, DNA, you have a lot of it. you got about six feet in every single one of your cells, quite a lot of DNA that you can unwind the whole thing. So um, it's very, very, very small, very tiny, um, which is why it, uh, you're able to have that all inside of your cells. So um, essentially what happens is we wind it around DNA. Um, we keep it wound up like a sewing bobbin. Um, if you just had six feet of thread laying around on the floor, it would get really messed up. It's uh, easy to get tangled up and everything like that. Um, so what we do is we wrap all of our DNA um, around these little tiny proteins called histones. And these are the bobbins that hold the sewing thread that is your DNA. And it keeps everything just kind of nicely organized together. Um, we wrap our DNA around these little histone proteins. Um, then we wrap a couple of histone proteins together to make everything even more condensed um, called a nucleosome. Um, and then eventually what's going to happen is all these little nucleosomes are going to be stacked on top of one another um, to form a chromosome kind of thing. And that's essentially what's going to happen. I mean, you can see that happen here. So all of the little um, individual um, 
um, sorry, histones, all the little individual histones, you can see those here, um, with their DNA wrapped around them, are going to form a, a nucleosome, which is then going to be stacked on top of another nucleosome, on top of another nucleosome, which is eventually going to be condensed and condensed and condensed and condensed um, into a chromosome. I mean, you can see that down here. Um, so these chromosomes take up a lot less space. This is the yarn ball, whereas the chromatin, the unwound version of the DNA, just the loose yarn ball, if you had that floating around in your floor, just a bunch of loose yarn, um, takes up a lot more space, and it's a lot easier to uh, mess up as well. So if you had to worry about uh, cell division taking a piece of this DNA, this loose, uncoiled yarn ball from one cell to the other, um, eukaryotic division, we have a bunch of DNA, way more than prokaryotes, this would be a super messy process. So we condense all of our DNA down into the form of a chromosome when we get ready to divide our cell. So it's not this loose coiled yarn ball, it goes into these nice little chromosome shapes. And then we condense it down, um, so that way it's easier to deal with. It's easier to control and easier to move around. So this is the cell cycle. Um, and this is going to be how cells divide, the steps that they take to divide. So. The very first thing that's going to occur is the uh, phase called interphase. And every single cell in your body that divides my, my, by mitosis is going to spend the vast majority of its life in the phase called interphase. Um, and that phase interphase is broken into three separate phases as well. Um, so cell division um, is called mitosis, and that's a very small part of the mitotic clock here. Um, so the very first phase of interphase is called G1, or GAP1. Um, and essentially what's going to happen during GAP1 or G1 is that every single cell, the normal cell, if it's a happy functional cell, um, is just going to do its normal day-to-day -day thing. It's going to be eating, it's going to be growing, um, it's going to be maintaining cell structures on the inside. It's just going to be living its day-to-day -day thing. Um, not a whole lot's going to be going on inside of that cell other than just um, keeping itself functioning, being a happy, normal cell. Um, eventually what's going to happen um, is that cell will reach a stage where it's ready to divide, the S phase of interphase, or it will be getting ready to divide. So as I talked about earlier, the very first step of cell division is to replicate your DNA, make a new copy. And that's what's going to happen during the S phase, and S stands for synthesis. So you're going to synthesize a brand new copy of your DNA. Um, your chromosomes are going to start to be uh, uh, copied, um, make a brand new copy of everything right there. So you've got two copies of the DNA inside of the cell now. And now the cell knows that it's going to get ready to divide, um, so it's going to enter into the next phase of interphase called G2 or GAP2. I and mean, this is going to be just making sure that you've got everything that you need to divide. Did you replicate your DNA correctly? Do you have all the proteins that you need? Are you the right size to divide? I mean, if you're not, anything that you need um, will occur during G2. You'll grow a little bit more. You'll get the extra proteins that you need. You'll make them, um, or anything that you need will occur during G2. Um, at the end of G2, that cell will, in theory, have everything that it needs to divide. Um, then it can enter into the process of cell division, uh, mitosis. So, mitosis is the, uh, essentially the division of the nucleus, copying the nucleus, making a copy of that, moving it to the other part of the cell, to the poles, um, and then splitting the cytoplasm, the cell itself, in half. And that's the um, concept of mitosis, cell division, um, can be broken into mitosis and cytokinesis. So mitosis is splitting the nucleus, making a new copy of that, um, and then cytokinesis is splitting the cell in self, itself in half and making a new copy of the cell. So let's go ahead and talk about what's going to happen during the uh, stages of cell division and what happens during the, the, on each, uh, inside of the cell during each stage. So G2, um, we've already gotten a brand new copy of our DNA. You can see that here. Um, you can see one blue chromosome and its copy here, one red chromosome and then its copy here. Um, so this is a diploid cell um, with two copies of each chromosome inside that will eventually be um, replicated and then split into our nucleus with one copy inside of each kind of thing. So you can see G2 down here, um, our chromatin, our loose DNA, it's not backed into a chromosome yet. It's still just loosely coiled inside of our cell, um, but that cell has uh, made new copies of its DNA and it's getting ready to divide. Now this is a plant cell here, you can see it's very uh, uniform, it's a little cell wall here, um, and an animal cell, a little harder to see because it doesn't have a cell wall, cell membrane here. Um, so um, our spindles for division have started to form as well. Um, and the little um, 
um, division fibers, the spindle fibers have started to form just a little bit, but not very much. So all that really happens in G2 is the cell's going to check to make sure that it's replicated its DNA correctly, which it has, um, and then it has all the other things. It's the right size. It's got the right proteins inside that it needs to divide. So once that it's uh, entered into late G2, it's checked to make sure everything is correct. It will enter into cell division. Um, prophase. Prophase can be broken up. The very first phase of cell division, you can break it up into two separate uh, phases. Um, early prophase and late prophase. Um, so in early prophase, essentially what's going to happen is the chromosomes are going to start to condense and start to become visible inside of the cell membrane. You can now see them. Um, so you can start to see the little uh, darkened blobs start to show up here, um, whereas over here it's a very uh, loose uh, blob. You can't really see anything inside of there. You can now see some little, uh, little darkened granules, little darkened balls start to show up inside of the nucleus of these original cells. Um, the uh, division spindles, the centrioles, are starting to uh, grow their spindle fibers as well. Um, and they're starting to move from the middle of the cells, you can see here, they're starting to move to the sides. Um, eventually what's going to happen is the cell will split in half. Um, and it will, uh, these work like fishing, fishing rods, um, and this is the fishing line. And that will eventually attach to the middle of the chromosome, you can see that here, um, and then pull them apart. So the fishing lines, fishing reels, um, will start to move to the sides of the cells, each end, um, to pull the uh, chromosomes apart. So as this con process continues, um, late prophase can be broken apart, the next phase of prophase, um, when the nuclear envelope is gone. It's going to break down. So what's going to happen is we're going to have to move the chromosomes from one part of the cell to the other and then split the cell in half. If you can't get to the chromosomes because the nucleus is in the way, it's very difficult to remove them from start, uh, move them from side to side. So the nucleus is eventually going to be broken down. Um, so the spindle fibers can move to the inside of where the nucleus once was and attach to the middle of the chromosome called the centromere. So that's late prophase. The uh, chromosomes are going to be released from the nuclear envelope. It's broken down. The nuclear membrane's gone and the spindle fibers are going to be attached um, to the chromosomes at the centriole, right there in the middle. So then the next phase that's going to occur is called metaphase. Meta means middle. Um, all of the chromosomes are going to line up in the middle of the cell. You can see here, the spindle fibers are completely attached to the middle. Um, and now what's going to start to happen is they're going to be slowly reeled back. These are the fishing reels. This is the fishing line. And what's going to happen is the fishing reels are going to slowly reel back these uh, individual chromosomes. So the X's in the middle will separate into two individual sides of that X. So one little side over here will travel this direction, and then the other little side will travel this direction. Um, so you can see that down here. So metaphase, they've all lined up in the middle. You can see the spindle fibers attached to them. Um, and you can see the spindle fibers over here. You can see the spindle fibers over here that are going to eventually pull those chromosomes apart um, as that cell gets ready to divide. The next phase is anaphase. Ana means apart. So you can see here the cells or the fishing rods, the spindles, are going to start to be pulling apart the chromosomes, splitting the X's apart um, towards the middle of the cell, uh, uh, away from the middle of the cell towards the poles. You can see that here. The chromosomes are going to start to separate. The spindle fibers are pulling them back. The fishing reels are reeling in the chromosomes. You can see them starting to separate. Telophase is the next phase. I mean, you can start to see here, the nuclear um, envelope has started to reform. The chromosomes have reached their destination. They've reached the poles of the cell, back to the um, end where they need to be. Um, the spindle fibers have detached. They're out, the nucleus is reformed, the correct amount of chromosomes are in each side. We started out with two in each with the original from the copy. Now I have one in each, which is exactly what we want. Um, the nucleus is reformed. You can see that here. Um, so you can see that there as well. It's starting to reform. Um, the division plate in the middle is starting to form as well. Um, and you can see the cells getting ready to divide. It's starting to slightly pinch itself in the middle. You can kind of see that here. You can see that here. You can see the division plate in the middle. This is called the contractile ring or the cell plate in a plant. And that's technically the end of the mitosis phase. Um, and then you enter into cytokinesis, which is when the cell cytokinesis means splitting. So is when the cell is actually going to split. Um, so the contractile ring is going to form if you're an animal cell that's going to split you apart. 
um, it's going to essentially be like putting a rubber band in the middle of a, uh, um, um, a, a, um, like a uh, water balloon or something. It pinches the water to either side. Um, and this, if you've ever done it, you can twist it off in the middle and then seal it real quick kind of thing. And you can keep the water on either side. And that's essentially what's going to happen. And you can see here it's going to pinch it off in the middle with two fully formed nucleuses, one on either side. Um, when you split that in half with two fully formed tiny little cells, um, on either side that are identical to the cell that it originated from. So one cell splits into two identical copies kind of thing. Plant cells, you can see down here, um, the cell plate divides in the middle, um, and then that cell wall, since you have one, uh, cell, can't grow, uh, cell wall doesn't get any bigger, you just grow a new cell wall in the middle. Um, and the cell walls for plants just get, cells for plants, every time they divide, they just get infinitely smaller. They just divide half and half and half and half. Um, and then eventually what happens is you end up with a cell wall that's so tiny that the cell walls can't divide anymore, um, and that plant cell will die, and that's how plants die kind of thing. <laughs> so anyway, um, the very first thing to look for um, in, in animal cells, like I mentioned in, in cytokinesis, is that formation of the cleavage furrow. I mean, you can see that here. Furrow just means uh, ditch or kind of a... a kind of a bend or squish kind of thing, squish in kind of thing. For it really means uh, ditch or, or uh, kind of a um, hill kind of, or, or uh, yeah, ditch, best way to put that. Um, so you can see the squeeze in, like a furrowed brow, like a wrinkle, I guess is another way, good way to put that. Um, so you can see the furrow starting to form here, um, and it's squishing in the cell eventually. Like I mentioned, you can see it over here in real. This is a real cell. You can see it's eventually going to squeeze its way all the way through and pinch this cell in half to form two. Um, so, after the cell has divided in cytokinesis, um, it will enter back into G1. Um, the new, both of the new cells, both of them will start G1, um, and then they will go, grow and grow and then replicate their DNA, enter into G2, and then start the process over, and then both of those two new cells will do the same thing. Um, until eventually what happens is that cell eventually, or uh, the organism eventually will die. So cells have a terminal lifespan. They can only divide for so many times, and eventually they will run out of uh, ability to do so, and they will die. So every single time you see these little white lines during interphase, there's something called a checkpoint. And then when this occurs, your body, the cell, reaches these little checkpoints at these little white lines, and it goes, oh, am I a correctly functioning cell? Does I, do I have fully formed DNA? Do I make all the proteins I need to have? Am I good enough to continue to replicate? Is it worth it for me? Ah, oh, yes, let's go ahead and do that. Move, replicate DNA. Now, new checkpoint. Have I replicated my DNA successfully? Um, have I not replicated my DNA successfully? Have I? Yes, I have. Good. Let's move on to the next one. This next checkpoint right here before the cell finally divides, make sure that everything is successful. And if you don't meet these checkpoints, sometimes that cell can either go back and fix it, but if it can't, it enters into apoptosis. That cell will die. It will kill the cell because it's a useless cell. There's no point in it existing. It cannot successfully divide. So having it around is kind of useless. It will either... Um, freeze itself in a, a something called a G0, a frozen stage called a non-existent or the resting stage, and the cell just kind of goes to sleep. It just doesn't do anything. The cell will die. Or sometimes what can happen is when a checkpoint is not successfully met or something goes wrong during this process somewhere, cells can become cancerous. The cell loses the ability for itself to regulate cell division. So when it meets this checkpoint right here, it goes, did I replicate my DNA successfully? No. Who cares? Go ahead and replicate anyway. Did I? Am I big enough to divide? Do I have all the proteins that I need? Am I even the correct cell? No. Who cares? Go ahead and replicate anyway. So when a cancer mutation occurs inside of cells DNA, it overrides the correct division process. It allows cells that are not correct, that have incorrect DNA, um, incorrect proteins, incorrect genes that don't function properly to replicate like crazy. And when they start to grow like crazy, they form something called a tumor. I mean, a tumor is when a regular cell becomes broken. And when that regular cell should be dividing every five or six days, starts to divide every two or three hours, it starts to form a little ball of itself, those identical cells that are all broken in the middle of uh, some tissue, and that's a tumor, a little blob of broken cells. Now cells come in two different forms, or tumors I should say, um, benign and malignant. So malignant tumors, you can see this is one over here, and this is a benign tumor. So benign tumors form um, 
in the little nice rigid balls and they have a little small capsule of connective tissue that keeps the cancerous cells um, successfully contained so they're surrounded by like a, a lymph tissue or muscle tissue or, or something like that some sort of uh, tissue um, tendon or something like that that keeps the cancerous tissue contained um, so it cannot cause problems anywhere other than where it's at it's stuck um, if it forms inside of your lung, it's stuck inside of your lung. The lung tissue keeps those cancerous cells trapped there. Now, a malignant tumor, on the other hand, does not have that little membrane of connective tissue keeping it surrounded and, and, and keeping it all contained. So it's a little loose ball of broken cells. What can happen during that is those little broken cells can sometimes um, break apart from the main blob. They're not contained. They're not held in. There's no door keeping them in, uh, inside. And they can enter inside of the blood vessel or the lymph system, anything like that. And they can take a ride anywhere along the body. Wherever the bloodstream goes, wherever the lymph stream goes, those cells can ride there with it. And then somewhere along the way, they can hop out of the bloodstream. Maybe they can stay in the bloodstream. And they can start um, growing a new tumor somewhere other than where they originally started. So malignant tumors can seed, as you see up here, new tumors anywhere throughout the body simply by hitching a ride through blood vessels or lymph nodes. Significantly harder to treat, very dangerous. You start out with lung cancer, it ends up in colon cancer, breast cancer, and things like that, brain cancer. Very difficult to treat um, as it moves around. Benign tumors, you can usually go in and remove this whole tumor, a um, little localized radiation, and you're good to go. Malignant tumors, significantly more difficult to treat, and a lot more complicated surgeries involved with that one. Now, lots of things can influence um, your risk of getting cancer. Um, now, uh, things like your genetics, you can't really uh, argue with. If you are genetically predisposed to certain types of cancer, you need to avoid things that, uh, uh, that can uh, help, that can increase the chances of you getting it. Um, if you're predisposed to lung cancer, predisposed to breast cancer, it's probably a good idea to stay away from um, lots of UV light and things like that. Um, predisposed to skin cancer if it runs in your family, if it's genetic. I mean, there's also things in the environment that can increase your risk of getting cancer, and you're probably familiar with these things like smoking, things like sun tanning, eating bad um, processed foods and things like that. Um, so uh, lots of different things as you do on your daily uh, day to day uh, basis, day to day uh, activities can impact how your DNA is functioning. Anything that damages your DNA, um, viruses can do it, anything that causes damage to the cell's DNA. Um, if it damages the DNA, it could potentially cause the cell to have problems regulating cell division. Anything that damages the cell's DNA can potentially cause cancer to arise. Um, so you encounter tons of these kind of things through your daily um, activities. So it's smart just to wear things like sunscreen, avoid smoking, um, eat a little better food, get some exercise, and stuff like that. Um, so we have ways to treat these. Um, cancer therapies, uh, surgery, like I mentioned, to remove the the uh, um, uh, tumor itself, chemotherapy drugs. Now, these type of drugs target actively dividing cells. Cancer cells, the target with them is they divide very quickly. That's kind of the get-go. Um, it's a cell that divides more often than it should. So cancer drugs, chemotherapy drugs, target cells that are in cell division, which is why people that have cancer or chemotherapy sometimes have their hair fall out. Your hair grows very quickly. Um, so if you take a drug that targets quickly dividing cells, um, cancer cells, um, cells that are also quickly dividing, like your hair sometimes get caught in the crossfire and they get killed as well. Um, and then radiation um, can be used to kill these cells as well. Radiation just kills everything it touches um, in the little localized area. Um, so essentially you just use this instead of surgery to kill the tumor kind of thing. And that's the end of this slide set, guys, over how um, mitosis works, how cells divide, how DNA is replicated, um, and sometimes how cancer arises. So if you have any questions over this, guys, please send me an email. And if not, have a good rest of the day.